The Bard and the Glade Written by Lance Phelps Read for you by the author Wickerus held his gaze at the empty eyes of his daughter. He was supposed to be ready to return to the field. His brother needed help with the planting. But Wickerus could only stand watching his lifeless child of two years. Christina sobbed at their daughter's side. Wickerus glanced at her. A grimace flowed across his face before he returned his eyes to Elitus. A gray face looked back. Did she accuse him? But she was no more. The village priest will be here soon, echoed through Wickerus's mind. He turned and looked at the door. It sat slightly open. Dim morning light cast shafts across the too small hovel as dust hung in the air. The rough straw bed that held Letus seemed to cradle her. It held her as she held her father's eyes. But there were no tears in his eyes. He was to be strong. It was for his wife to cry. She was always softer than the others in their village. Christina moved closer to the bed and gently held her daughter's tiny hand. Tattered brown clothing slid away from Alita's arm as it moved to Christina's hand. The lines that only true pain can cause etched themselves into Christina's face as she kissed her daughter's hand. Alita's small frame covered a small part of the family bed. Wickerus moved to the door. Christina looked up at Wickerus. Vertical lines of dirt were painted on her face like a mockery of a clown. I need to plant the field, Wickerus said with a matter-of-fact tone. Christina looked down as Wickerus walked out the door. Is Christina taking it poorly, brother? Wagandis, pulling seeds out of his pouch, questioned softly as he worked side by side with Wickerus on the family plot of farmland. Our daughter has died. How is she supposed to take it? The response was quiet, and it caused Wigandus to lean in towards his brother. We have all lost a child. We all grieve. But we cannot let that distract us. The Lord is expecting a better yield this year, and we cannot disappoint him. Wickerus' eyes followed the ground as they worked. Wigandus turned to his brother and added with a slight hiss, We need to work, brother. There is talk of punishment. But Wickerus only nodded his head. Wickerus looked up and examined the landscape. It was colorless. There was color, of course. Deep blue horizons and clear skies. Green treetops with fluttering bird flocks. Black earth underfoot. Soft and freshly tilled for the planting. But there was no color. No soul. Life was devoid of an essence that once was. At the edge of the clearing a dart of red flashed in and out of Wickerus's sight. He squinted his eyes when he heard the baying cry of hunting dogs and the pounding of horses' hooves. The Lord, on his hunting mount resplendent with equally colorless cloth, burst from the forest wall in pursuit of the dash of red. Just as quickly as he appeared, he sped across the field and delved back into the woods. The dull face that watched this scene could not muster the vicarious thrill of the chase. It was for him to work in this field. Wickerus turned back to his work and continued to plant. The rustle of seeds mixed with soundless footsteps, a soft soil, and the sea-like sounds of leaves moving in the wind reminded Wickerus of where he was. The work was ever before him. The day stretched on and the sun rose into the sky. He began to build and sweat pooled on their foreheads as they toiled on. Acre after acre, the small party planted. As the evening grew near, the softer amber skies faded into view. A gradient of color, a panoply of majesty, 
splashed across the sky. But still, it was colorless. Finally, the day's work was over. The small band of planters broke to make their way to their respective houses for the evening work. Wickerus walked slowly in the fading light at the wood's edge, this small footpath he had taken so many times before. The night sounds began to set in. The cacophony was splendid. Frogs croaking, crickets chirping, birds singing their night dirges, and an owl seeking his evening meal. Yet through it all, Wickerus walked in silence with his head draped. It was the crack of a twig that caused him to look up. Wickerus leaned in to get a better look at what he saw deep in the woods. Fire. He saw fire hung in a clearing a couple hundred yards away. Were there travelers about? Was this a scout for a rival lord? Wickerus moved in to get a better look. Torches were hung in a ring around a small glade. Wickerus blinked as he tried to understand what was here. In the center of this small clearing, rows of logs were gathered, all pointing to a central location. But even though torches lit the area, no one was around. He stepped into the clearing and started making a round, looking closely at the fine torches lighting the glade. One torch had a peculiar tracework pattern near the hook securing it to the tree. It resembled a clover, yet it was pointy at each end of its three lobes. They're a fine tool for any bard, really. A man's voice, smooth, rich, and full of joy, filled the small clearing of woods and made Wickerus jump where he stood. He turned quickly to find the source of this voice and was stunned by what he saw. The man who stood at the center of the glade wore bright red clothing with billowing arms. Intricate tracings swirled through the chest, arms, and trousers of this tall and regal man. As Wickerus took in this stranger, the man's eyes softened. Dear soul, you hurt. The statement was not up for debate. His tone was that of a grieving man who nevertheless had the cure. You have come to the right place, my brother. Please take your ease. I have bread and wine. The man gestured to a plate that rested in front of one of the logs near where he stood. But more importantly, I have a bone for your soul. Wickerus straightened and narrowed his eyes as he asked, Might I ask, sir, who you are and why you have come? Ah, but that is the question, dear soul. I am a bard, and I have come a long way in search of people like you that are in need of a healing that cannot be found in drafts or in a poultice. The bard's voice sounded oddly reassuring, and despite Wicker's better judgment, he found that he trusted this man. I see pain in your eyes. I cannot offer complete healing for the hurt that you have, but I can offer you relief for a time. At that, the bard pulled out a harp and began to tune it. Wickerus slowly made his way to the seat that the bard had prepared for him. The plucking of the harp strings, as the bard tuned his instrument, sent gentle notes into the air. The bread and the wine looked appetizing, and he sat and began to rip small bits off for the tasting. The rich, yeasty bread blended perfectly with the dark red wine. The sounds of the harp ceased, and the bard looked up with a grave expression. The bard looked at Wickerus's face. Their eyes locked, and Wickerus's expression fell mute. The bard began to pluck the harp strings in a rhythmic succession of notes that fell into line with each other. It was a quick, almost frantic sound. The bard sang. At first, his song was low and mournful. The rich tones of his voice filled the glade, yet still Wickers's heart was not moved. He continued to eat his bread and looked away. The bard was not deterred. The music built into a high march, and the words of this musician from afar echoed off the lifeless trees. Movement after movement, the bard's song rose and fell over the course of a few minutes. <laughs> then, all at once, the song fell silent, and Wickerus looked back at the bard. 
knowing, doleful eyes returned his gaze. The bard hung his head. For a moment, Wickerus begun to think that this was all that the bard had to offer him. He looked about, wondering if now he must go. This bard had not given him the relief that he had promised, but then again, a few did. Just as Wickerus was about to rise and make his way home, the bard's voice rose again. His skillful fingers flew across the harp strings and pierced the air with a sound that seemed to strike Wickerus in the chest. He looked at the harp as the sound filled the glade. The bard sang. His voice intertwined with the harmony of the harp strings to create a rich tapestry of music. Wickerus sat, stunned by what he heard. The music seemed to flow around the glade and make the trees weave with its rhythms and rhymes. Wickerus looked to the ground. A grave expression passed itself onto his face. The music built once again and his heart sang along. He looked up into the night sky. Up and up the sky went. Constellations of stars filled Wickerus' eyes as he gasped. They hung above him and joined in song as the music rose again. The universe began to enter its clarion song of wonder. Up, up his mind flew into moons and stars and other worlds lush with other lands. His heart leapt in his chest and he stood looking around the small clearing. It was so small now, yet every color and sound floated off its source and swirled with the music that the bard made. But the colors, the colors, tears welled in his eyes, and Wickerus staggered as the magnitude of what he saw dumbfounded him. Trees, grass, bugs singing along, the night owl, the ferns that whispered with the wind, all of them joined in song with the magic of this song. Wickerus sat, unable to stand the gravity of what he saw before him, but what he saw next shocked him to his core. Aletus walked into the glade and looked at Wickerus, but it was not quite Aletus. She was older, not by much, and wiser. She did not seem to be completely there with Wickerus. She was almost a wisp, yet firm enough for Wickerus to see. They met their gazes and tears streamed down Wickerus's face. Aletus walked over and wrapped her arms around her father's neck. As she stood before Wickerus, he could see in her eyes understanding that he could not begin to have. Wickerus fell into racking sobs as this vision of his daughter looked into his eyes with deep kindness and a beatific smile. Why, Aletus, why did you have to go? In reply, Aletus smiled all the more. He knew that she was telling him that there was so much more that he could not grasp, so much that she could not explain if she tried. Is there no way to console your father, to make me understand why? Alita smiled and looked deep into her father's eyes. With one small finger, she pointed up. They both looked into the sky and then back at each other. At that, a bright, ghostly light filled the glade. Alita smiled and bounced away across the glade. Wickerus stood and watched her with a bitter smile. He knew that she would have to go. She looked back and waved at her father. He waved back with tears falling. With that, the light faded. The clearing fell silent, and the bard looked at Wickerus with a smile. Wickerus looked back and returned the smile. This has been The Bard in the Glade, written by Lance Phelps. If you enjoyed this work, please visit divedeep.net to offer your impressions of this work. <laughs>